everyone. This is Julia. And this is Chris. And this week we have another interview with a new friend of mine from the UK. His name is David Sangwell. David made his mark in flair bartending, and now he has his very own bartending podcast, Bartender HQ. Yeah, he's got some pretty incredible stories from his years in the flair competition business. And uh, yeah, he enjoys long walks on the beach. Um, bartending blindfolded. Bartending blindfolded. Parachuting from a helicopter. I don't think he was parachuting. Somebody I else was know. parachuting. Anyway, some really cool stories. You're going to have to listen in to figure out who was parachuting and let us know. Yep. So yeah, let's go ahead and get into it, shall we? everyone. We're here with uh, David Sangwell from Bartender HQ, and we're going to be talking about his podcast, kind of what he's doing on his end, and uh, we have our first international um, bar celebrity on Mixology Talk podcast. So thank you very much, David Sangwell, for joining us. Hello there. First time I've ever been called a bar celebrity, but I like it. Let's go with that. Let, I think we can make it stick. I think so. <laughs> so yeah, um, you are running a podcast as well um, called Bartender HQ, if I'm not mistaken. That's right, yep. Uh, and it's all running from bartenderhq.com, which is my website and blog uh, as well over here in the UK. Fantastic. So, yeah, I was going to ask you kind of what you focus on um, on the podcast and, um, yeah, just kind of talk about what you do over there. Well, the uh, the podcast is quite new. Uh, we're just under 10 episodes at the moment and... Um, I don't really focus at all. I uh, put in anything that interests me at all about bars. Uh, my background personally is in uh, flair bartending quite a lot. So I include a bit of news about different flair competitions. Um, I don't tend to enter anymore. I'm a bit old for that now, uh, having been bartending 14 years. Oh, wow, um, yeah. But I do get us to host them nowadays a little bit, which is quite nice. So I still get to hang out with all the guys and sounds like drink a few beers. Yeah, um, and then we go through each week we have a tips for tips section, so a little extra tip for the listeners that they can put into practice straight away to earn a bit of extra money behind the bar. Oh, nice. Uh, I like that. Yeah, then we have a cocktail every week, a cocktail of the week, which I try and steer away from the crazy ingredients that no one's going to have to hand. Um, obviously, I don't want to include the unicorn tears that you guys frown upon so much uh, from the crowd. <laughs> They're just bars. so hard to get. <laughs> yeah, we just ran out, you know. <laughs> exactly. So if you so, know a guy, we'd love to find a, a good source. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so I try and focus on stuff that people can make at home if they want to or they can use behind the bar. Um, I mean, I have a, a little ebook that's on my website. If anyone wants it, it's completely free, which has got 10 cocktails that I've done quite well with in the past. Uh, and you can just grab that from bartenderhq.com. Nice. Um, and yeah, I, I sort of focus on anything from the bar industry that interests me, to be honest. Excellent. So I have a, a, quite a few questions for you as far as flair bartending, because I was never coordinated enough to even dare do that. <laughs> okay. So the whole Far process away. of it really does fascinate me. Um, so how did you like get involved and how did you get started with flair? Okay, so when I was at university, uh, I studied in Stafford for product design and then got myself a little bar job and as a result, don't have a degree. Mm-hmm. Um, I got far too interested in bartending. Uh, there was a Greek guy who I used to work with uh, who used to flip just an ice cube uh, with tongs into the glasses, and all the girls loved him. So obviously I had to learn this. Of there course. you go. Um, <laughs> and it fun. was this was the year 2000, so we were early days of the internet. Uh, you know, there was no YouTube or anything like that back then, but people were putting out um, training videos, uh, and you could get some of the trailers online mm -hmm. occasionally from places like barproducts.com. Um, and so I started off with learning all the stuff I could watch in the trailers for free <laughs> just uh -huh. by uh, breaking things in my university dorm room. Uh, I was going to ask about that. <laughs> um, and yes, one of the one of the tips that I learned back then was to wrap up bottles with insulating tape. So if you've got a, a breakable glass bottle and you want to practice with it and you don't want bits of glass stuck in your feet, oh gosh. wrap it up with insulating tape. And then if you do drop it and break it, it's still going to break, 
but everything's in one neat package that you can just throw in the trash. That's a really good tip. That's I like brilliant. that. brilliant. I, I was going to ask you, actually, because I'm, I'm imagining, you know, once you're good at, at flair bartending, you can use glass bottles, no problem. But there mm-hmm. must be a huge learning curve and, and there, there must be damage. There just has um, got to be a mess. <laughs> there is when you're learning. Uh, I mean... I was really trying to do it on the cheap, and I know a lot of people do. Um, so I hadn't invested in the plastic training bottles that are made by places like Flareco, um, uh, and that's that that's why I started wrapping up wine bottles in uh, in tape. Um, and knowing that people like to do that, one of the posts that I've actually put up recently on Bartender HQ is how to basically assemble yourself a free flare practice kit. Oh, cool! With nice. things like wrapping up bottles in tape. Um, old promotional tins that have been given out by different uh, brands. They they tend to end up in bars and end up in the cupboards when uh, nobody's using those anymore when the promotion's over. So how to pick up all that sort of thing, you can find that over on the website. Cool, and we'll definitely have a link to that on our um, on our website, um, mixologytalk.com slash episode 25. So 25. we'll have uh, links for that for sure. So awesome. that makes a lot of sense that there's plastic training bottles. I kind of wondered about that. I, I was yeah. kind of wondering, I mean, it, it, when you get to the really high end stuff, like the competitions that you're talking about, I assume, are the bottles really filled with liquor? Uh, they are actually, yes. Um, especially, I always wondered about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it seems silly, doesn't it? But um, I mean, when I used to compete early on, uh, a lot of the bottles were actually primed with water rather than liquor. Ah. Um, uh, competing at places like the Roadhouse, which is the the sort of pinnacle of the UK scene, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, but nowadays, because so many of the competitions include a mixology component, uh, you're not just doing a flare routine which stands alone. You you're also having to create a drink uh, with your own recipe, which is tasted by the judges. And oh, wow. um, I, I host a, a competition called Masters of Flare. Uh, which is with um, some guys from Birmingham who run a flare club and they all get together on a Monday night. Uh, they've got a bar that has let them keep their bounce mats uh, out the back and they take over their downstairs bar nice. on a Monday night. <clears throat> and they they actually run... The Masters of Flare competition has so many different categories. You've got uh, best individual flare. You've got most entertaining routine, which is always the one that I used to go for because I now work at a magic shop, and so I'd include things like flash paper and explosions and fireballs going off. Oh, my off gosh. All that kind of thing. Uh, there's a mixology component, and this is all within your six, five- or six-minute routine. Um, oh, wow. And the judges are tasting all of these drinks, and then the drinks themselves are auctioned off for charity. Oh, oh that's, that's a great. great idea. So the crowd get to buy what they've just watched being made. And because I work at a uh, an 80s nightclub as well, that's where my, my partner actually runs. Um, we have these enormous coupette margarita glasses called Partinis. Partinis, nice. nice. And uh, they're about, I don't know, 48 ounces, something oh like gosh. that. Oh, my God. You aren't kidding. They're enormous. And I must have put into it about four ounces of Patron cafe exo oh my uh, so so that made about 80 pounds for my cocktail for charity which is 130 140 dollars nice. nice that's fantastic i love that you've included a charity element i think that that sometimes can make these things a little bit more fun too yeah i mean they uh we we managed to get some sponsorship in from different uh companies people like maxim who do in the UK, they take care of Stolich near um, Patron mm-hmm. and a, a bunch of things like that. Um, Cause also support the uh, the competition as well, and um, they supply the beers for all of us and the judges. Nice. <laughs> so, Very, that's important. Yeah, we have a good night. <laughs> so awesome. I have one technical question because this is a thing that I've mm-hmm. always kind of wondered about Flair and um, how do you not throw liquor all over the place when you're spinning the bottles and throwing them in the air and stuff because it just seems like centrifugal force is going to push all of that liquid right outside of the bottle. Um, yeah, it's it's basically a lot of practicing, <laughs> a uh-huh. lot of getting wet when you practice. I believe that. Um, but the main thing is you'll see that flare bartenders have kind of two categories of bottle. You've got a working flare bottle, which is um, anything over half full. Mm-hmm. And then you've got an exhibition flare bottle, which is where they've generally got a, an ounce or two in the bottom. Mm. Um, and those are the ones that you can pull off your really crazy moves with. 
Um, but I was always more interested in the working player stuff um, because there's, there's just so many more of these things behind the bar. Yeah. Um, and I want to be able to step behind that bar and do all of my flare moves all night long. I don't want to be uh, I don't want to be limited to when a bottle's got an ounce left in it, or be constantly putting an ounce back into a bottle. Yeah, just to do my routines. So that that doesn't interest me. If if flaring slows me down when I'm working, I'm not interested in doing it. That so makes that, a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, and that kind of brings up another point: is um, like, what are some really good uh, functional flare moves that you could do behind the bar that don't really slow you down? Because it seems like a lot of flair um, is more about the show and not about the function. But I know there's kind of a boundary where they kind of almost overlap. Uh, there certainly is. Um, some of the stuff that I generally get people to learn, first of all, is, I mean, I'm guessing uh, where you guys would work, uh, you'd have your glassware on the front of the bar or on the back of the bar? Where would, where would you be grabbing your glassware from? Um, typically from um, the back bar. Okay, um, so all you'd be doing is literally uh, grabbing the bottom of the glass, because they're all upside down on the back bar, I'm guessing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you grab the bottom of the glass, you pitch it up into the air, and catch it just uh, cushioned behind your back with the other hand. Now, that's, that's one of the things that I would generally do with pretty much every glass I pick up. They'd either go behind my back, either spinning or flat, um, and that's nice and quick. And it's just quite showy if you go nice and high with it. Other things, uh, when you grab a napkin, uh, when you grab your bev naps from the caddy on the bar top, uh -huh. um, if you spin those, now you have to grab them the right way around and make sure that your crease is on the right side. But if you've got the crease right next to your fingers, you can spin them like a frisbee in the air, catch them on the back of your hand, and then just turn your hand over to pop it down in front of your guest. Oh, wow. Oh, these are that, fun. It looks really, really classy and really, it, it just says to them, look, we're going to have a good time. Yeah, no, that's very, very it, cool. I'm, I'm sure it absolutely sets the mood. I mean, that just sounds like so much fun. And the best thing about these napkins is you cannot break them. That's a good point. <laughs> hey, Chris, if you want to practice on napkins. Yeah, seriously. Well, that <laughs> and if it goes wrong, there's no noise. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Awesome! Very cool. Um, now, you also said uh, in your when we were talking earlier that you open helped open a um, restaurant or a hotel in Dubai as well. Yeah, that's right. I um, the way that I actually got asked about this is through a company that I used to do event bartending for called Mojito Events over here, um, and they got in touch with me and said, "Would you be interested in going over?" I had had a really terrible shift behind the bar that day, so of course I was interested. Of course, <laughs> um, <laughs> and it was actually while I was working for Fridays, just before I left uh, Fridays, I qualified for the bartender challenge, and I think I competed in that about three days before I left the company. Um, and I actually did part of my routine blindfold at that time as oh, well. Oh, wow. Gosh. Which was very good. I'll, uh, I'll try and get a video of that up on, I was just about uh, I to ask on YouTube we, somewhere. I would love to see some of your videos. Um, but yeah, I mean, I got asked to go and do this um, at the end of September in 2010. And by the 1st of first of november i landed in dubai so it was really quick i had to get rid of my apartment my car and everything over here wow. and went and lived out there for just under a year how was uh how was that experience of opening a hotel because i know with uh opening a restaurant it's just it's absolutely crazy for probably the first six months um i can only imagine what it would mean to open a hotel in a foreign country well, I mean, I was I was there as a bar uh, bar supervisor, bar manager, and and trainer, mm -hmm. uh, and there as a flair bartender as well. There was another guy who came over with me from the UK um, called Dean Parkin, who I'd actually worked with before, which was delightful. But I didn't know he was going until the day we landed. Oh my gosh! Surprise. And worked out because I was told someone else was going, who I also knew, <laughs> and we we ended up sharing an apartment over there, but uh, didn't know until we met each other in the apartment. How funny. Oh, that's really crazy. Well, it's a good thing um, you yeah, like them. It was absolutely crazy opening the place. The hotel itself had three bars, um, all run by a single Mich uh, three Michelin starred chef. Oh, wow. Um, Yannick Aleno, uh, who is a French guy, mm -hmm. as you can probably imagine from his name. <laughs> uh, so we had um, Stay by Yannick Aleno, which was the super premium sharing tables, all 
absolutely stunning black and white baroque style restaurant um and that bar we were running with very much classic cocktails so your martinis uh, manhattans old fashions uh, margaritas that sort of thing all done with super premium spirits Mm -hmm. um we had our all-day dining restaurant which was called zest uh and the kind of the concept for that restaurant was that each dish was served three different ways. So if you ordered chicken, you could order it Middle Eastern, Western, or Asian style. Oh, wow. That's um, interesting. So you'd have chicken those three ways. You'd have beef, uh, not pork, because it was Dubai. Uh-huh. Um, right. But, but all of your main courses would be served those three ways. So we created a cocktail menu that matched. So we would... Uh, create a Middle Eastern, Western, and Asian style gin and tonic. Oh wow! For example, um, so you could have a, a drink that complemented your meal. So we had um, a, a date infused gin for the uh, for the Middle Eastern style. We had uh, Firenze infused, so with uh, Martini Rosso and Campari mm-hmm. um, for for the Western style. And I'm trying to remember what we had for the Asian style, but I believe. I believe uh, it had a, a passion fruit edge with fresh passion fruits. Oh, wow. That sounds, that sounds really fun. Really good. Yeah. And then the, the bar that I was there to open was called 101, which was the marina bar. And when we landed in Dubai, it wasn't built yet. Oh. That's exciting. So, so yeah. Did we, you bring a we, hammer? <laughs> we should have done. Uh, it was about three weeks after we landed that we, um, that we actually got into our own um, bar. And our opening night was a party for the end of the Louis Vuitton trophy. So it was <laughs> wow. absolutely crazy. Big name DJs. I mean, this bar, to put it in perspective for you, we had... Um, have you guys heard of the AC Milan football team? No. They're one of the biggest football teams in the world. They were here for... They, they were with us for New Year's Eve. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, wow. The whole team. Um, you know, we had... Uh, we had Louis Vuitton, we had Chanel there, we had you know, footballers from all over the world, wow. Russian oligarchs, we had anyone you want you can name. On opening we night? We pretty much had them there. Was that on your opening night at, at this one? Bar? Oh, uh, I mean, we had the, the Louis Vuitton trophy was the opening night and there were a few celebrities around, but not people that I particularly knew. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of my favourite nights there, though, we did have um, one of the sheikhs of Dubai and 30 of his friends parachute into the bar. Of oh, course. my gosh. Why not? <laughs> Does that count as and, carpooling? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, they all came together. Yeah, um, it's, it's uh, low emissions, I suppose. Good for the environment, yeah. maybe. Right. It was it was fantastic because the wow. bar itself was out on the Palm Jumeirah, the, the artificial island that ah. they built out of the coast. Oh, my um, goodness. That sounds incredible. And it's uh, you, you don't believe, before you've been there, how big this thing is. It's 20 minutes to drive up to the top of the palm and round to our bar. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And, and actually, the bar next door to us, um, the hotel next door to us, is in Mission Impossible 4, because Tom Cruise was filming there while we were doing our opening. That's oh incredible. Oh, my God. We're going to have to check it out. That sounds incredible. <laughs> it, yeah, it's actually... It doubles, because they obviously they featured Dubai in the movie... Um, but the hotel next door to us, which was called the uh, Zabil Saray Hotel, is actually the Indian set, the Indian party in the movie. Oh, wow. Oh, good to know. It's filmed in Dubai. That's crazy. You must have had some really amazing experiences out in Dubai because I know that was kind of the, um, a huge center for development um, for – it's probably still going on, actually. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, I mean, it was crazy busy over there. There were some – fabulous bars um the one actually in Sabil Saray that I used to fre- frequent was called Voda Bar mm-hmm. and it looks like something out of the Tron movie uh, everything glowing from underneath white um egg-shaped seats and uh, wow. it was absolutely stunning so they don't I, do things by halves over there yeah, yeah it sounds like it so, so I have to ask all of this sounds incredible so what are you doing not in Dubai right now Um, I was there for a year to open the place and then, you know, I I needed to come back to see my family and all that sort of thing. Um, But the the crazy thing is that I don't spend the majority of my time in bars anymore at all. Oh, I know exactly how that is. I believe that, yeah. (laughs) Excellent. So uh, anything um, 
you're working on? Um, how can people get in touch with you? Um, you know, the social media website and all that. Yeah, um, I mean, you can find me over on bartenderhq.com. We're also on uh, Facebook. We're on. Uh, we will be on YouTube very, very soon because one of the projects that I'm working on is actually um, Flare for Beginners, if you like. Ah, oh, perfect. Uh, and I'm going to be using the new iPhone 6 Plus that I picked up uh, as soon as it came out because the slow motion footage that you can get from this thing is insane. Awesome. It's so good for tuition on this sort of thing. So I'm going to be filming super slow motion video uh, that you guys can access. Um, and yeah, you'll you'll be able to basically learn a bunch of easy to do flare moves that you can put behind your bar in a couple of nights. Awesome. So for anybody out there who is interested in getting started with flare, it sounds like they should definitely check out and keep an eye on your YouTube channel. Yeah, I'd love to um, to hear from anyone that's interested in learning. And also, actually, coming up on a, a future show, I've had confirmation today that Scott Young from Bar Smart in the US, uh, or actually in Canada, I think, they're based in Vancouver, he's going to be a guest on the show for me pretty soon. Oh, and nice. he is the guy that taught me on those old videos. Oh, that's amazing. Funny how... So I'm so pleased. Yeah, small <laughs> world. That's wonderful. Very cool. Well, excellent. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. And we'll have links to everything in our show notes over at mixologytalk.com slash the number 25. So thanks again, David. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Thanks. Absolutely. Cheers. So thanks again to David for joining us and telling us some incredible stories. I think we need to go check out that bar in Dubai, that's for sure. Sounds amazing. Yeah. So by the way, we'll definitely include some links uh, to some of David's videos in the show notes. So head on over to mixologytalk.com slash 25 to take a look at those. So next week, we're going to be picking up where we left off a couple months ago with another five things your bartender wishes you knew. So stay tuned. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube. And as always, check out the show notes by clicking on the right.